I think so. So maybe it's time. Maybe we can get started. Let's do it more on more of a formal uh, sense. Um, so what I'll be talking about uh, is a set of highly convivial tools uh, that for developing content and for autonomously publishing content. So the keywords here and the interesting part from my perspective is actually not the technology or the know-how of it, but it is those two words in yellow, convivial and autonomously. So the word convivial, the way that I use it is in the way that Ivan Illich used it in the context of tools for conviviality, not uh, in the convivial mode uh, as a word in English. So we'll go into that in a bit later. So just making sure that we are all in this room for that purpose, right? So um, let's, uh, let me introduce myself quickly. Um, um, my name is Mohsen Banon. Um, I am a, a software engineer and software developer. Uh, but what we will be talking about, or what I want to be talking about, is not necessarily just the engineering dimension of it, and um, societal, social, uh, philosophical, and ethical aspects of how we communicate with each other, how we produce content and publish content is also on the table. Um, so. Uh, let me start by just putting in my name on their uh, Google. And uh, this is what comes out. So um, skip the images. The, what, is, <clears throat> what I want to stress is that uh, the top uh, thing that shows up, or, or even if it wasn't, is not a LinkedIn thing is not a corporation for which I work, is not Facebook, but it is a site which is under my own control. So I, for myself, I have uh, done some degree of worrying about autonomy and putting it on the table in tangible forms. Now, a whole lot of software engineers around here have similar things. What they have not done, and what I have done, is that that site is available to each and every one of you and anyone else who wishes to have it. The entire software and the entire uh, service framework for doing that is available. And that was the talk that I wanted to give that got rejected, and the tools that are being used to, to do the content publication is what we are talking about now. So let me very quickly, uh, oh, what did I do? Let me go to the other one. Mm. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go uh, to my page very quickly. And what I want to show is not really anything about myself, but it is uh, how content, large amounts of content, not, not a few things, uh, can be published and categorized. So if you go to my uh, publications list, uh, you get a list of various things uh, on different topics that I have done. And all of these are built with this, these tools. And after you build the, top, the, the content, typically what happens, it goes to uh, Docs or Us or uh, YouTube. And neither of those is the right way of doing it, in my opinion. What we should be doing is paying attention to actually being the primary source of the publication of our own content. So 
let me go back and continue with that. So th that much about me. Let me get a quick feel from you. Uh, all of these slides and a whole lot more about how to do what we, what we are talking about is already on the web. So in a sense, you don't really need uh, me saying much here because uh, <clears throat> much of the information is available. Uh, in the next hour for, for us to be productive, I can tailor what needs to be said towards you. And uh, for that, I want to ask you some questions. Are any of you teachers or writers? So, a teacher or writer? Writer. Writing uh, as well. Instruction. Instruction, so, so a, di a dimension of being a teacher. Um, anyone here uh, below 18? Uh, have you guys heard about Emacs? Do you know what Emacs is? Yes. Some of us know what org mode is, too. Some of you know. Uh, but let me get a feel. So you know what Emacs is. You know what Emacs is. You know what Emacs is. You too? Yeah. I use Vim. <laughs> I, I use Vim. <laughs> oh, you use Vim. Oh, you know what Emacs is, but you use Vim. We'll come back. You know what it is. Uh, no. OK. Um, and uh, how about tech? Do you, any of you know what tech is? I've used it. You have used it, so, so, so you, know, you know what that is? I don't know what that is. You don't know what that is. Okay. Yeah, the so what is tech? Okay, in what sense? Uh, oh, uh, yeah. T, X, uh, X, E, oh, latex, latex. Okay, never mind. Sorry. So you know what tech is. Latex is. Right. Everybody talks about latex. Uh, how about, no. Mm. You're familiar? No. I know it's something to do with math. Yeah, all of these, uh, there is, so in terms of general exposure of what they are, uh, there is some understanding, but the way that I have put them together and I use them are distinctly different. So uh, Emacs, for example, is oftentimes compared against VI or Vim. That is not the context that uh, I am using it. It is an integration framework and the way to build a parallel against Emacs in that context is not VI, but it's GNOME, your entire desktop. You go into it in the morning, and that's it. You don't do anything else. A lot of people don't use a desktop, though. So. It, it is. And none of this is the sort of thing that a lot of people do. Uh, from, your sh from your shell through them? Yes. Right, but you will see, it is far, far more than that. Uh, and LaTeX is essentially a, uh, a programmatic, in a sense, document preparation paradigm, which is completely different from the typical um, WYSIWYG model of um, everything else, uh, Word or, so it is, an abstraction of the document. So at no point when you're writing, you should be or you would be thinking about how it would look. You would be thinking about how this, what the structure is. And the uh, last stage of being rendered is all outside of, you should be all outside of your immediate control. Um, this thing, Tevia, is, so back to tech. The key piece that is important for us is to recognize it not necessarily as a tool, but as a language. So it's a markup language. Now, over time, uh, industry trends have been against the direction that I am advocating. Markdown has come about, and a whole lot of other things where people uh, make it simple for themselves to write. And the difficulty with that is that you lose a whole lot of richness in terms of what you need to do. Yeah. Let me ask you one question. You said you're not familiar with uh, Emacs or Latex. Can you tell me how you write and how, what tools you use right now? Just text your documents, text papers. 
text just editors. ordinary text editors uh, to platform I Okay, okay, okay. Have you looked at Lix, the I think yes. uh, QT ed based editor? Yes, 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 yes. I'm familiar. Uh, haven't haven't dug deeper any deeper on that. So that kind of gives me a feel for uh, how I need to tune things. Um, um, as we go through this, I'll be doing a whole lot of things in here that you don't see the keyboard. They'll throw you off. So let me first explain um, what is going on. So um, my real machine broke. I had to take a Windows machine, but it's irrelevant. I have a virtual machine on top of it, and you don't even see the Windows thing. Um, so within that, in Ubuntu, um, you have virtual desktops. So during the presentation, I have set five virtual desktops that I'll be switching from. One of them is this uh, Emacs Pure Text, which helps me follow my notes. The second one is a browser uh, preloaded with some of the things that I'll be talking about, that I'll be going through. Uh, the third one is uh, the PDF output of um, this presentation uh, using an ordinary uh, uh, viewer. Uh, then there is uh, this uh, PDF PC. It's a presentation console. Um, that I just want you to know about, that, that as you build, uh, you, you can use that. And the last one is the actual sources to uh, the, the presentation that has produced that, that output. Now, um, so just uh, knowing that as I switch screens, this is what's going on. Now, on the non-technical part of it, um, so uh, the, the way that most tools are done are the commercial model. And um, I'm looking at it differently. There are um, three, and also the words that I'll be using are a little bit different from the traditional ones. Uh, let me. Uh, take care of that vocabulary piece quickly and deal with the, the key concepts. Um, just one moment. Uh, I don't have it. Yeah, this is good. So the, the word that I used as conviviality is um, a, a concept that uh, Ivan Illich presented about 40, 50 years ago. Let me just read these three lines. Uh, to the degree that an individual masters his tools, he can invest the world with his meaning. To the degree that he is mastered by his tools, the shape of the tool determines his own self-image. Convivial tools are those which give each person who uses them the greatest opportunity to enrich the environment, the fruits of his or her vision. Industrial tools deny the possibility of those who use them, and they allow their designers to determine the meaning and expectations for others of others. So the idea here is uh, you have got Word and PowerPoint on one side, and you have got something like this on the other side. And uh, this guy is saying in abstract terms that we have this concept true for everything that we do. And if we were to look at them, you could, we could categorize them. Who is in charge here? When I'm writing, is it Microsoft who decided for me how I should be thinking and organizing my thoughts and worry about the page layout and the rest? Or is it me who is driving it? And so that, that, that was what 
uh, I meant by the word conviviality. Had any of you, were any of you familiar with, with that abstraction, with that notion? Okay. Then the next uh, concept is that of halal and haram. You have heard it um, probably in the context of halal food, uh, a type of food that uh, conforms to certain things. With software, what we have been doing the, uh, as a community, we have coalesced around the concept of FOSS and FLOSS, a free and open source software. Um, I am saying that at that level, even at that level, we have gone sideways. That the key pieces, the key thing that is important for recognizing the correct manner of existence of software is not that it is free. And we don't know what free means. It's freedom of what? It's certainly not the software. Uh, and the open source aspect of it is just a piece, it's not the full picture. So what I am saying is we should take this notion of what is the right manner of existence of software one level up to ethics uh, and say uh, philosophically speaking as a society we say that software must have these qualities to be for example internally transparent, non-ownable in, in the sense of the control. <clears throat> and to label that in that way, in English, the best that we could do, we would, we would call it ethical software. But <clears throat> ethical software is too weak. Other languages have better <clears throat> uh, equipments for us. And in uh, Arabic, halal is that word. And I have chosen to use that for my own use of the words. So then building on that, um, <clears throat> you'll see throughout uh, various things that I'm putting out, the use of the word uh, liver halal, which is uh, uh, we recognize that there is a liver movement that we don't want to split. We want, we want to recognize that it's the same thing. And um, uh, so th th that is the terminology that I'm using. Did that make sense? So, yeah. Okay, so then let me uh, go to the Linux, uh, Linux Fest page. So you read this and that's why you are here, uh, probably. Uh, did any of you um, actually go to that website and take it. Yeah, you I did. It. I finish, but I you you took some. Yeah. So um, over the past uh, four days, I have changed a whole lot of it. So, but the latest is up there. So let me talk about the, the slides that are out there. Um, I, as I was reorganizing it, it became clear to me that I'm doing two things. One is I'm describing what these tools are. The second one is uh, how to be using them. And then it became clear that I shouldn't have them in a single document. So I split them into two documents. And now uh, there is a how-to document separate from that, which um, I want to point to. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah. So. Uh, the, and then the PLPC number for that is 1AD060. So if you just replace the 38 with a 60, you would get to, to this document. And um, so after we have uh, gone through all of this, um, and if you were to install the necessary software on your machines, then you would be able to uh, use the walkthrough um, and the how-to document. Uh, let me uh, now build, go a little bit sideways on this. Um, the um, 
tools that you need to install on your laptop, on your Linux box, to let you do all of this is uh, uh, pretty complicated. It's all over the place. There are many, many things that you need to bring in for them to fit together. And this is becoming a common problem if you want to tackle a, a problem like this at that scale there is no other way you have to uh, in, <coughs> select many components these components uh, were built unaware of one another and uh, when you put them together the r r recipe of how they fit together is very complicated <coughs> can become very complicated so to address that in the broader sense i have put together a framework that I call BISOS. It stands for BISTAR Internet Services OS. Think of it as a layer on top of uh, Linux or Ubuntu. So you get Ubuntu, and Ubuntu lets you pick, bring packages from here and there, and then you're in charge of uh, <clears throat> controlling them and configuring them on your own. And you can't really do all that much on your own because typically you're a writer. You're not a software guy. Yes? So I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't actually read the, the summary, but BiStar is like a server and... Yeah, so, so that's kind of like the leading, the, what I wanted to do. I wanted to muddy up the water so that it becomes clear that I need to describe BiStar and BiSauce before we can use this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so let, let me, so as I do this, uh, we will be going off of a tangent. We are not talking about content generation anymore, but in a sense we are, in that the document that I'm, I'll be showing you is a rich, full-fledged uh, document that has everything, voice, uh, videos, and everything else. So uh, consider this as, we'll walk through this very quickly to, to accomplish both things. Uh, <clears throat> if you were to just, with the same uh, formula, put 180.054 or just click there, you'll get an access page that then brings you to a, uh, a, a, to a JavaScript-driven page that lets you have uh, the text and images and videos and voiceovers. So if you were to go there, and you can do that on your phone as well, um, and then just click on the play button. Welcome. My name is Mohsen Banon. I'm a software and internet engineer. I present to you an overview. Just of gonna wait for the first few slides. Digital ecosystem. So you see, at the end of it, it goes to the next one. Uh, sound gets started automatically again. This information is also available and as a set of PDFs. Uh, let me let me stop and this. Um, so so uh, this ability to write in LaTeX in abstract terms, then. Uh, subject it to a LaTeX to HTML converter, which becomes these slides. Then at every slide, you specify a title page, a name for it. And that name shows up in a directory with a 10 second silence audio file, which at your convenience, you can go and record whatever you want over it. And all of these gets auto-associated with one another. So uh, your audio is a layer on its a voice over your slides. Gets there, sits there, puts in. And the key piece here is the convenience of associating the name of the slide with the name of the audio file and managing it as you go through. A whole lot of tools give you that by numbering and such and none of that works. And uh, creating that uh, association is, um, uh, is a new piece that was not in the existing tools that I used. 
So now getting back to what Bystar is, I, I'll do it quickly. Um, le let's say that we wanted to fully re reject the uh, existing um, models of the internet which really revolve around milking us as uh, sources of information. If we wanted to do that, we would, want, we would need to uh, start by giving autonomy to individuals. So each of you needs to have his own website. Then once you have your own websites, we would uh, need to add a layer on top of it which allows for inter-autonomous interactions. So for example, dating, for example, trade. And uh, that whole thing that we would build, we'll call it a digital ecosystem uh, of its own. And we would call it liber halal because uh, we are expressing that from our perspective, this is the ethical manner of building a di digital ecosystem. Now, where does the star in by star comes and what's that name for? In Unix, the globing symbol is star. And by star means that within this digital ecosystem, everything is on the table. We want to build all the necessary tools that come, come to do this. Um, so these next few slides would do that. Now, inclusion of video in a slide. Um, it, the, the way um, that I am doing them here is you would produce your video the usual way that you do. Then I would actually put it on YouTube because of bandwidth issues. So all of this is running <coughs> on uh, a, a data center that I am uh, running myself, and I don't have enough bandwidth in large scale. So, so for videos, I do that. So if I was to click here, and let me do, Greetings. My name is Mohsen. And then you see the YouTube the thing show up. <coughs> and I'm the origin of the Liber Halal by Star Digital Ecosystem. And so, so this would be a way of uh, mixing that. Now some defects, some problems. <coughs> let, me, let me stop this. You saw I clicked on the audio at the bottom page and it didn't have the integration that's necessary between my slide progression software and the video thing. So that's a problem that needs to be solved. Uh, won't be. Yes. Another option for the video would be peer American model, which also has similar embeddability. Yeah, but I don't want to go there. The, the whole idea is if the, uh, YouTube, YouTube, well, YouTube was embedded there. Let me understand what you said first. I said the PeerTube system has similar functionality, and that's completely decentralized. Okay, not familiar with that. Uh, uh, so we need to take a note and, and, and look into that. And can you tell me briefly, what is it? Uh, PeerTube, it's the video part of the Fediverse project like uh, uh, Mastodon and so on, use the same underlying technology, except it's designed for uh, providing federated video and a YouTube-like experience Okay. similar federation. Okay, okay, so b basically it's a uh, distributed repository. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, each, uh, each, each, each decentralized decentralize that people host their own videos, but they can federate across. Right, right, right. So d that is, uh, in essence, uh, what, what my story is all about. So let me walk through these quickly and get to the point that relates to uh, uh, how we would be using it in uh, our context. Um, let me touch on this quickly. Uh, 
this notion of abstracting individuals um, in software terms, they all become by star objects. So there is a decentralized, so a whole lot of people have gone about this in different ways. Uh, this uh, by star object is a decentralized abstraction of a content or a service portable across uh, one uh, host to another. Uh, and uh, and the by star objects fall into two general categories, information objects or service objects. So the contents that I'll be showing you here are by star information objects. So that is the repository that you use to capture everything. And uh, beyond that, they really map into Git repos. But these are Git repos that uh, can be combined in known ways. Uh, so so that, that was one piece that we needed. Um, yeah, let me um, get to the other pieces that we need. Now, this is um, a picture of uh, uh, how do we integrate large pieces of software together in a disciplined way. The, uh, the way that I'm uh, using scripting, both in Python and Bash, to bring things together, revolves around this concept of interactively invocable command modules. And these are, you can think of them as uh, categories of scripting frameworks that let you do two things. One is uh, build the scripts uh, more cleanly. And the second one allows you to uh, use them beyond the command line using, uh, for example, the org mode uh, within Emacs or a GUI. So this notion of uh, interactive command lines modules is another thing that we need uh, as we move forward. And the, the, the purpose of it is <coughs> to put all of these things together. We need a whole lot of scripting. We don't want to be doing this scripting naked, the usual <coughs> bash way, uh, but that we have a framework for that. And yet the rest of it is for the broader context. We can, we can skip. Let me just move forward. Yeah, let me get to this piece. Uh, so this is uh, my perspective on um, the, the universal uh, <clears throat> platform uh, for both the service side as well as the user environment side. So today, whatever you do when you're doing Google Maps or whatever else, what is happening is a software service continuum. What you're running, part of it is running on your device and part of it is running on the service. And all of this is happening in the uh, commercial model and there isn't a universality for everything coming together. What if we were to leverage off of, in the open source community, in the liver halal community, if we were, what if we were to leverage over what we have, uh, which is more than what exists out there, and what we have, which is more than what exists out there, is the universality of Linux that Linux can go into tiny devices, into uh, iPods, or into pods, laptops, and large servers. And if we build on that universality, there is a whole lot of integration that we can do 
that is easier to do than what is happening today. So in this picture, on the uh, device side, um, there is no virtualization. We are saying that the device is um, so something that you use. Then you come to your Debian uh, Linux layer. Then you profile it. In other words, you throw away a whole bunch of software and you bring in some, some new things. And then on top of that, you put this uh, ByStar Internet Services OS, which is a set of well-known uh, things that let you uh, build, for example, uh, content generation capabilities. Then you do the same thing on the server side. For this uh, content uh, production and content publication side, the publication side of it clearly needs a server. And after I have developed my content at this level, I should be able to hit one key and say, take everything that I just built and push it to my autonomous service on the other end. And in the by star model, the uh, uh, elegance and the beauty is that you have full continuity across them. And for example, you can bring it a sock, the entire service and put it on your laptop. Do all, all the usage that you need and, and go build on that. So in order then to build and use what I'm talking about, you, we need to do it at the BISOS level, as opposed to me saying, here is one script here, here is one script there, get them all. No, I'm saying, go bring the entirety of BISOS, put it on your Linux box. And if I do that cleanly enough, you should be able to do it in a single shot. I'm not able to do it yet, but working on it. So, so BISOS would essentially be a set of standardized APIs? No, no, think of it as exactly what it says. It's an internet services OS. So, so it is, uh, it is what you said, plus a whole lot more. In other words, all the tools that I need to live within this thing. So you see, we have been thinking as technologists uh, in creating OSs that other people then do other things with them. And eventually, it, it becomes some sort of a digital ecosystem, which is mostly commercially driven. I'm saying let's do it the opposite way. I'm saying let's design the digital ecosystem first, figure out what are the things that we want to have, and then for that digital ecosystem, create an OS. So, and so the sort of capabilities that you need for, yes? Will it only run on Debian-based systems, or would it be cross-district? It, it should be, be easy to make it cross-district. Okay. This stuff is not fully baked yet. I am uh, placing uh, my effort initially on the Debian Ubuntu. Uh, but uh, if we get this right, uh, it shouldn't be difficult at all. To, uh, does, it, Harry, does it go beyond? So it's, a, it's like the file system, right? You use that to generate the associations. Is that right? Uh, no. Uh, the abstractions that you use are the by star objects. Yes, but where do those come from? How do you input them? Uh, there's a whole framework for it. From starting from where? Uh, starting from, um, let me understand your question better. Uh, so if you wanted to make a new page from start. Oh, f from start. Then where would you begin? Okay. Um, uh, allow me to take a bit of a rain check on that. Oh, I have an example. Sure. So it would be essentially like a standardized schema, and you would have plugins to applications you already demonstrated in, uh, with Emacs. So basically, you would need a, si a system of you know, various plugins for various applications and user applications that would then be communicating to this object schema, which facilitates this the, the uh, your goal of low, low uh, 
friction data tra tra trans uh, might moving data around low friction fashion. It, it, exactly. For for the purpose of content production, things are much easier. Basically, so let me explain in that context how things are. Over here, you have a content management system. In, in my case, it's Plone. And in my case, it's a way old version of Plone, just because I haven't had the energy to keep up with all the evolutions. So that content management uh, system on this side is abstracted as, uh, again, not how it looks on the screen, but the sort of things that you want to put in it. Then there is a BISOS piece for it, which says uh, push to this content management system at this location these contents that I just produced. So high level schema in the same analogy is the way LaTeX and style sheets that's right. right things. Right. So, so if you go back on the manifestation of them from a user perspective, when you see uh, by star.net slash PLPC 180.032, that 180.032 was the uh, content that got auto generated for me when I was building it here. Back to your question. So I say, give me a new content number. And then an association with an autonomous publisher that says, go publish it there. So. That all made OK sense. Um, so let me um, go back to the actual presentation with this information that we have and now walk through it because uh, we can do things. Yes. And your service objects are like uh, like pages? The presentation modules? No. The, the service objects okay. are the know-how through the data-driven know-how of using, for example, Apache or Plone yeah. to be configured a certain way and to be associated with uh, access control for a given user. So it would be like proxying away the implementation details of various publishing platforms. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So we went through all of this. I'm just going uh, very quickly. Um, key piece here is that the scope is everything from generation to um, autonomous publication. publication. Um, this is again that uh, uh, user side versus the service side piece. Uh, now, there is another part is after you have published something, if your goal was to actually create a momentum for what you have done, uh, that publishing doesn't get you anywhere. People don't come and read what you have written. And you have to engage in marketing towards that. So there is a content distribution paradigm that goes with this as well, which is essentially uh, taking uh, other content or that same content and integrating it with email and sending it out. So what you're building is not necessarily just a document. It could be a document embedded in an email in a way that it doesn't even look like a document. It looks like a full email and is subjected to a distribution uh, set of rules based, based on what you want. So you could have like an abstraction interface in front of promoted on uh, uh, like uh, through new social type federation right. and things like that. Right, but I'm Right, I'm not going that way, it's, it's pure email. Um, on the user agent side, within Emacs, there are very strong um, emailing capabilities. One of them is GNU's, and that's what we use. And on the server side, everything is QMail based. So uh, 
uh, it's essentially my own MTA, and I feed it uh, as I wish. So let me, oh, let's um, uh, give you some um, pointers to this in case you wanted uh, to actually go and get them. So let me, uh, sh oops, sorry, you got it? No, I didn't. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go to um, uh, Google quickly and and then go to uh, GitHub and then point you to where the code for all of this is. So just go to GitHub and on the public side of it without l l any login, just plug in my name. Okay. So what you get is not at uh, a whole lot of repos at, on this page, but it is uh, a whole lot of organizations. So organizations in GitHub have nothing to do with organizations. They are just collections of repos. So the pieces that you need, uh, uh, the ones that relate to the topic we're talking about is this content and then if you go in here to facilities and then in there you go to content production example you would get the sources for that PLPC 180060 all in here so let me just go to one of them uh, body press so this is the latex sources for producing that thing. Now, fully undigestible at this level, but you'll, you'll see that it's actually very easy to navigate through if you layer uh, Emacs with the right tools on top of it. So let me next. I'm just going back to show you a few other uh, uh, repos that are relevant. So if you go to this uh, kitchen sink symbol, uh, you would get uh, all the Lisp code that you need to configure your Emacs to be aware of all of this. And now all of this is a whole lot because it's content production plus all the abstractions that are needed for content publication. That made, that made sense. And then beyond that, if you go to the repos, all of by sauce in pieces is, is within, uh, within there. Right. Yeah. So every operating system yeah. needs a, a UI, yeah. and um, in this case, uh, Emacs has always been the ultimate uh, editor centered user environment. Yeah. So that's debatable, but yeah, I agree with that. Right, right, yeah. right. I mean, not to say that RMS is true operating system. <laughs> right. How are we doing on time? I think it's supposed to be over. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. Uh, most of what you need is on the web. So I kind of uh, went sideways a bit, but uh, the, the topic is too large to fit in an hour. Uh, so. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.